it's math behind ml is nothing but putting mind and math for quant so the math will be on the screen uh, we will not uh, go into equations uh, or complicated math stuff we will discuss math so it will help if you put mind into it then it will be a lot easier so that's my only request uh, let's slowly start with this session will the session will be for one hour and then we'll have some q and a sessions okay so many a places you would have seen data in some table like this uh, there will be a header row and rows of data rows and columns of data and how would we represent this data when it comes to analytics or data science or machine learning so this data which is in rows and columns can be stored in tables database tables or csv files uh, or maybe more than some more formats also we can think of but uh, this data can be stored in databases then when we store in databases what all we get as a side effect we can do relationships between two tables uh, same columns appear in two tables and we can connect the rest of the data for our purpose right so uh, when the data is available in a magazine that can go into tables and these tables can have relations now the question is if the data is available in tables what math can we perform before math what operations can we perform so when data is made available to us in rows and columns we can select let's say if there are hundreds of rows and hundreds of columns we can select rows that pertain to gender is equal to male or we can select rows that uh, have age as value greater than 21 so selection a filtering uh, is the option and we can relate between two tables we already discussed those are the operation basically select filter uh, and relate these are the operations that can be done on those tables so there is nothing math in it right so what is the math now we can aggregate let's say i want to know the average salary of a five years or more experience in the industry so average is of math maximum age in in a particular uh, department so that is a math so maximum average standard deviation uh, skewness you can think of anything so there are standard math available uh, 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 or made available to us in most of the databases uh, or we can write our own functions so uh, to start with we can aggregate data based on standard functions which are called inbuilt functions or we can write our own functions now uh, what more can be done uh, we can build dashboards with this math build dashboards uh, create alerts if the data is uh, on a daily basis it's getting added removed whatever it is we can create alerts those are the uh, purposes of uh you know result of the data getting stored in this format you can quickly process and present that's the idea so i should have put process and present that's the idea right so that's what can be done with the data in this now uh if you uh, uh if we think of data in rows and columns not bound by a uh, database as a framework then we can think of more math let's say we have this two columns of data x and y let's take x is about height and y is about weight uh, and th these are individuals a b c d e we can calculate distance matrix so the basic formula what is the distance matrix formula the distance matrix euclidean distance is the uh standard uh, formula for finding distance between two points when i say standard there are non standard ones also are applicable let's be critical about uh, euclidean distance what are the drawbacks of having a euclidean distance 
all of us know the formula for euclidean distance right y2 minus y1 the whole square plus x2 minus x1 the whole square under the root that's going to give me the distance agreed uh, so uh, what are the assumptions why this would work or why these things don't work so uh, let's be critical about it i have uh, we'll see the uh, euclidean distance in light of other formulas okay so let's take this there is a point between a and b there's a distance between a and b two points in the map can we use euclidean distance if we use euclidean distance would that be the right thing do i get the right representation of the distance between two points if i use euclidean distance no right so uh, the map has its own rules the roads it has its own turns left turns and right turns and it reaches a point typically it will be more than uh, euclidean distance right so uh, this distance what you see in the map in purple color is called manhattan distance so uh, is there a formula for manhattan distance can anybody for a standard grid grid let's say if we have a standard grid like our graph paper uh, every point is equal distance from the other point every cube every square is 1 cm square there probably we can have a standard formula there but it is not always standard so for manhattan distance we have to write our own function depending on how all the data is dispersed right and uh, yes so this is the this is also a manhattan distance if you look at it a to b this is also a manhattan distance this is also a manhattan distance whereas when there is only one euclidean distance just we are being critical about euclidean distance the euclidean distance may not always work that is the idea okay and uh, similarly there is something called uh, uh, minkowski distance this is an average of uh euclidean and manhattan distance you can think of this and uh, there is one more distance uh, let's say we have x axis here and y axis here we are assuming the scales are more or less same between x axis and y axis what if the x axis scale is every centimeter is 100 y axis scale is every centimeter is 0.1 How, what do we do typically if the scales are different in a two column data or a 10 column data the scales are not same scales are different some are in thousands some are in hundreds some are in millions some are in decimal points what do we do to bring it to the same scale we do something called standardization right we will discuss the standardization techniques also but uh, to bring it to the same scale we do standardization so we standardize x axis we standardize y axis and then find distance between two points so uh, if that's something you wanted to do then we have something called mahalnobis distance mahalnobis distance uh, will uh, help you uh, you know uh, will give you the standardized we will do the standardization first cal calculate the uh euclidean distance and uh, give you the distance number so you don't have to do the standardization operation explicitly so that's an interesting distance formula you want to go down deep into the math why would this mean standardization there is a yes inverse op, op, yes inverse as a option here that is nothing but a covariance matrix covariance matrix inversed so you can go deeper if you want to otherwise uh, Uh, google for mahalnobis distance in any language you get a formula you get a result similar to euclidean distance or uh, for manhattan distance there is no formula we discussed there can be more than one manhattan distance you will have to write your own rules there now that uh, we talked about all this uh, uh, there's a correlation also can be perceived as distance correlation between two series can be perceived as distance we'll come will not get into that before that um, there is something called cosine distance anybody has any idea what a cosine distance is 
the formula is here. We will not worry about the equation there. How is cosine distance different from Euclidean distance? When do we apply Euclidean distance? When do we go for cosine distance? OK, so uh, the representation is what is going to be different. Here we have the data in rows and columns. Uh, we can think of the same data as vectors, right? What is a vector? Vector is a point in a plane. So instead of having 9 as a x, 49 as y, I have 9 comma 49 in a plane and refer to 9 comma 49 from origin. That's what vector is. Vector has a magnitude and distance uh, and uh, angle. So if you look at it, this is the origin. Vector is A. Uh, there is another vector is B. Basically, these are two points in a space or a, in a plane, you can call it. And uh, what is the co cos theta? Cos theta is nothing but a dot product of A and B. That is, A is uh, distance between 0 and A. B is the distance between 0 and B. Sorry, sorry. Uh, this uh, modulus of A is distance between 0 and A. Modulus of B is distance between 0 and B. And uh, dot product of A and B is what? Dot product of A and B is nothing but uh, A cos theta. A, B cos theta. So uh, modulus of A, modulus of B cos theta. So we have distance of B here. Uh, what is cos theta? Cos theta is uh, this distance into uh, A. So basically what does dot product mean? Dot product means uh, what is the uh, proportion of this projection in B? So uh, sorry, I'm a bit uh, complicated things. It's actually a simple uh, math. Uh, so what is a dot product? Dot product tells if let's, let's imagine a scenario where A and B are same. A and B are same means cos will be zero. The theta will be zero, right? If theta is zero, A and B are in the same plane and uh, uh, we multiply the distance of zero to A and zero to B. So that will be the maximum. So if, uh, if, a in, if cos is 0 is 1, then this is just a straightforward multiplication. If this, as the angle increases, the distance between 0 and A, which otherwise would have been maximum, will go on decreasing. If it is 90 degrees distance between 0 and A and uh, 0 and B, the angle between 0 and A and 0 and B is 90 degrees, then there is a 0. Cos theta will be 0. Cos cos 90 will be 0, right? So that's the, basically we are measuring the projection of vector A 0 to A to uh, 0 to B. So that's the idea. So uh, that's the dot product. When you do cos theta, the higher the A dot B, uh, the distance will be higher. Basically the theta will be smaller. Higher the A dot B, theta will be smaller. Smaller the A dot B, theta will be higher. That's the plan, that's the idea. Now, what does this mean? The dot product, sorry, the cos theta, cos, basically this is the cosine distance is what we are talking about. Let me see if I have another chart, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So the cosine distance is given like this. So the distance between two points will be measured in same units, whereas cosine distance is given in theta. So how 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 the how does the theta vary? Theta will vary from 0 to 90, 90 to 180. 180 to 270 and 270 to 360. So this is the 360 degrees. So if the theta between two vectors are smaller, then uh, we know what the distance is. Uh, if the theta between two vectors are higher, we know the distance between those two vectors are higher. Uh, so when we represent with theta, what happens? 
somebody can tell me what happens so we represent cost 0 is 1 cost 90 is 0 so the 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 cosine distance is going to range from 0 to 1 if it is 90 degrees uh, the distance will be 1 if the if it is 0 degrees distance will be 0 what will happen if i go to the 120 degrees or 180 degrees one vector is on this axis another vector is on this axis so i get minus 1 as the distance i hope this is clear now cos theta will end up with minus 1 if the theta is 180 degrees cos theta will end up in 0 when theta is 90 degrees and cos theta will end up in 0 uh, cos theta will end up in 1 uh, if it is in x axis 0 degrees so the advantage we get in cos theta which we don't get in euclidean distances we get to know the direction of the vectors 1 and minus 1 Euclidean distance will always be positive. It can never be negative. So cos theta gives you uh, directions which side uh, the uh, variation is. But what we lose in cos theta is we never know the magnitude. We know the angle, we never know the magnitude. We know the angle between two vectors and that is represented as a distance. And if the angle is so wide, it crosses now y axis it gives us the value in negative so we know uh, if the uh, if the vectors are pointing in two different directions then it is represented in negative uh, numbers uh, otherwise it is represented in the same positive number or same negative number if it is in the same direction so we get an idea of the direction but we don't know actual distance so for actual distance we end up using euclidean distance whereas uh, if you want to uh, account for the direction, we have to use cosine distance. Is that clear? Any, any doubts? We can spend some time here. So we discussed Euclidean distance. We discussed Manhattan distance. We discussed Minkowski distance. And we discussed Mahalnobis distance. So these are the ones I use mostly uh, depending on my requirement and for segmentation this distance formulas are important so depending on what we use i hope this cosine distance and euclidean distance we are able to differentiate it uh, so uh, what we learned is if you want to represent data into rows and columns how can we do it and if we want to represent data uh, in uh, vectors, how can we represent data and vectors and what is the use of uh, representing data and vectors. We can uh, visually uh, look at the data and then uh, take some measures on top of it. There is another way of representing the data. How do we represent the data? Let me get the data for you once. Okay, if this is the data, I have some data here. I have some data here. It, it is a rows and columns data, right? I have row ID, order ID, order date, ship date, ship mode, etc, etc, etc. How do I represent this data? So numbers can be represented as is in rows and columns. Let's say I have a region. Region is south, west, north, east, central. Or state is there or country is there, segment is there, consumer, home, home office or corporate. We have some segments. So how do we represent this data? It's a very standard one, right? Everybody knows it. What do, how do we represent a data like this? This we call it categorical data, right? We have four regions. We have three segments. We have some categories, three categories, furniture, office supplies and technology. And we have some subcategories which runs into, I think, five, about 20 of them are there maybe. And we have product. So we'll come back to product name and all. 
but how do we represent this categorical data? What do we call that? We do something called one hot encoding. All of you agree with me? Yes. yes. Now I have such a huge data set. Already it is running into 20 plus columns. And uh, let's take five columns have categorical data. Each column has some 10 odd categories. And if I do one hot encoding, I end up with another 50 columns. Is that right? So that's how we do it and we take forward to uh, machine learning. Now, uh, if I give, you know, this is something too difficult to get our head around if you want to uh, make sense of it, but machines make sense of it. They can handle n number of columns, but uh, if you're mathematically inclined, there is one more way of uh, representing this data. Vectors is imagine 70, 70 dimensional vector is again a difficult uh, proposition. Let's represent it in what do we call matrix. So ship mode, there may be three, four shipping modes. There may be three segments. There may be five regions. There may be two categories. There may be some three subcategories for each of the category and there may be some continuous numbers. Because we represent every record into a matrix, there is a, it opens up some opportunities. Any of you can guess what opportunities does it open up? Now, instead of having 100 records, we are going to have 100 matrices. And let's say I want to predict the profit given all this input. This is my label. Now, because I'm representing data in matrix form, what does what opportunities does it open up? OK, uh, maybe I'm asking a tougher question. Uh, how many of you are familiar with convolution neural networks? Now that you have data in two dimensions, all the techniques, all the uh, uh, all the possibilities convolution neural network opens up can be applied here. You can use this to you can use this to do auto encoding. You can use this to do lot more things, right? Uh, imagine um, imagine let's say there are about how many columns here? There are six rows and five columns. Having thirty having 30 input values or having an input value in 6 by 5, the representation itself is different. Henceforth, the stress on the network will be a lot, lot lesser. You can design your uh, learning algorithm architecture, CNN architecture, uh, much better. So I like this. Though we are talking about structured data here, uh, what are the data is there? Image data is anyway matrix. That is uh, uh, that is uh, three channels will be there for each image. RGB channels will be there. In addition to that, three matrices. Every image has three matrices. Uh, here, structured data, I, we represent it in matrix. And uh, we use this uh, to build CNNs. And uh, we get undue advantage. Uh, you know, it's easy to solve the problem. At least the uh, load on the a CNN architecture will be much lesser. So just just a thought, you know, if, if you're mathematically inclined, uh, this is one more way of uh, thinking of representing any structured data. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, Vishnu uh, has a question. Go ahead, Vishnu. Sorry, uh, one basic question which is not clear for me is uh, you had mentioned that uh, the categorical data can be represented uh, I mean, together as a matrix. So if I understand correctly, what you're trying to say is since it is, for example, like enumerated, mm. you are going to use fewer bits to represent it or something like that? It is the same number of bits. Even if you don't represent it as a matrix, you are going to represent it as uh, columns, right? It's same number. 
shipping mode let's say there are three modes means you need three three options either this bit is going to be one or this bit is going to be one or this bit is going to be one here we have five because some other option had five bits so these two bits are going to be zero forever so bits are more or less same so you, uh, basically this is be being more represented in a homogeneous way i mean regardless of three options or five options everything will be same yes. numbers here we need to standardize it so we done, we have done some uh, jugaad to do standardization agreed uh, but this is this isn't this a better representation of the data which we are talking about so uh, or or if you if you have if you have worked on cnn probably you will be able to appreciate it otherwise it will take some time to appreciate it Uh, just it's a representation we are talking about representation of data can okay. we represent it in rows and columns can we represent it as a vector can we represent it as a matrix or in any form which is going to help us do a better job okay yeah yeah thank you so uh, even if it is a structured data like this can be represented as a matrix and uh, can be taken forward that's the point i wanted to drive uh think about it let me know if you want to discuss offline also we can discuss and we can represent much larger data in a much nicer manner and uh, uh, you know uh, you can build better architectures see in an architectures that's the idea i build my own architectures that's why i am okay. excited about this okay okay now that we have seen representation data can be represented in different fashion can be used based on represented manner we'll talk about summary statistics what is the summary statistics any metric derived from data what you have data let's say what is the data there are 10 data points i calculate mean i calculate arithmetic mean or i calculate harmonic mean geometric mean these three are different means has different use cases or a median or a mode anything i derive from data is a summary statistic or they are they are called as representing the data okay a standard deviation and range will give us an idea of what data is all this is possible right i calculate slope regression coefficients correlation coefficient mean squared error r square a mean squared error and r square are nothing but uh, regression metrics we'll talk about it now we calculate so many metrics right can i differentiate one data from the other when i say differentiate i have a data set i calculate a mean mean turns out to be 23.8 does that 23.8 uh, point only to that data set can i never have any other data set which has 23.8 as a mean i can have two data sets two different data sets which has 23.8 or to put it more generically i can have two different data sets with same average same mean same median or same statistics summary statistics is this something everybody agrees to if you you can calculate 100 statistics of a given data set you still can find another data set a different data set same same hundred statistics so uh, this is this will become this is the example given here the, there are this data set has two columns x axis is one column y axis is another column and there are four different data sets with same mean same standard deviation same correlation coefficient same slope same r square same mean square error this is called anscombs quartet if people are familiar with that jargon anscombs quartet this is only to prove statistics has its own limitations but yeah this happens rarely i can say not very often but uh, still this happens then how do you differentiate one data from another data one data set from another data set so that's where distributions come into picture 
distributions in my opinion represent the data or represent the differences in data very clearly now what is a distribution so distribution is nothing but okay let me go here this is a distribution x axis has values y axis has counts so uh, let's take an example i'll i'll do it here um let's say head and tail i tossed a coin 10 times i got six heads and four tails this is a distribution so uh we roll a dice and we mark let's say we roll a die 100 times and then how many times we got one how many times we got two how many times we got three how many times we got four five six and uh, you know this is a distribution now you i do i find out a distribution and somebody else also finds out the same distribution these two distributions doesn't have to be same distributions will be unique that's the point right so uh, this distribution will be unique uh, uh, you know there is a way to okay and this is this is the distribution this is called frequency this is called frequency distribution if i put probability here that becomes a probability distribution pdf we call it probability distribution function so we do this distribution when we do this distribution it will be different that's the idea it will be uh, somewhat different if not um, very uh, largely different uh, we'll discuss more about this so when we put a distribution what is the standard expectation this is a normal distribution it's a bell curve many of many of us are familiar with it when we when we when we mark the count and then it will look like a bell curve so this distribution has a characteristic let's say what the characteristic what is it i am talking about the distribution which you have plotted has two peaks something like this uh how should i say um uh what is the uh, uh this thing i have two dice what is the probability distribution or a frequency distribution of getting a sum so two i can get a sum of two right 1 plus 1 1 comma 1 i can get a 3 how can i get a 3 1 comma 2 or 2 comma 1 first die i can get 1 second die 2 or first die i get 2 or 3 like this 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 i can get a maximum of 12 right six phases in a die so minimum of sum is 2 maximum of sum is 12 now for this if i have to uh Uh, get the count i get a count uh, let's say i do it for 1000 times i get a count how many times i'll get two i'll get two rarely compared to six because there are more options to get six right 1 comma 5 2 comma 4 or 3 comma 3 or 4 comma 2 or um 5,1 there are more possibilities to get 6 compared to 2 so i get a, a bell curve again uh to show that i had an example here where is that example sorry guys yes so this is the this is our frequency distribution looks like anybody has any doubt there is only one peak here there is no second peak coming up 
in any normal any data set for that matter there is only one peak does that mean you don't get data with two peaks any of you want to contest this how many of you have seen data with two peaks when you do a frequency distribution if you are uh, checking some values i mean with a segregation of uh, positive and negative for example mm -hmm. so there there could be a you know negative side one peak and then positive side one peak could be you can you can pick and choose an example that shows two peak there but uh, that can so what does this two peak mean the characteristics of a frequency distribution or a probability distribution is to have only one peak any data set you genuinely go and collect it the the expectation around that data set is to have only one peak not to have two peaks first thing and uh, there may be cases where you get two peaks and what is the drawback when we do modeling that's the that's what we'll discuss now this is what one peak will look like i'll come back to this uh, i have some example how many of you are familiar with iris data set how many of you would have worked on iris data set iris has four columns four numeric columns and they have done the probability distribution here there is only one peak here there is only one peak here whereas petal length and petal width has two peaks sepal length and sepal width has only one peak now does that uh, ring a bell anywhere does that trigger any thought so this is a flower they have taken a whole lot of flowers collected the sepal length sepal width petal length and petal width they have measured and plotted a histogram or a probability distribution function we'll call it density plot now we see two peaks if it if of all the flowers belong to the same category we'll have only one peak does this mean there are two different kinds of flowers one which has smaller petal width another which has larger petal width one which has smaller petal length and another which has larger petal length does that mean something so uh, i have a excel sheet wherein i have put together this histogram you can go and see the petal length i have put it this is these are the data 150 data points this is a very standard data available on the web many of you must have worked on this i have taken the petal length and i have put all 150 records and uh, tried to do a histogram i see two peaks if i change the petal length to petal width i see two peaks this is one peak this is another peak just that uh, if you play with the bins you will get to get nicer peaks for me sepal width has only one peak sepal length also has only one peak and this is the normal distribution line which i have drawn now let's go to petal length instead of using all the data if i choose the only one species here i have only one peak if i choose versicolor alone i have only one peak if i choose virginica alone i have only one peak so uh, basically there are three species and each has its own peak but when we bring them together we get a picture like this so are we able to reason why there are more than one peak that's the basic question if there is more than one peak we should suspect there is more than one data set in our data set why should we suspect what is the purpose of suspicion every time we say we model a variable let's say we model petal width i am writing a machine learning model to predict petal width or i am writing a machine learning model to predict petal length that is the problem statement right why should we worry if there are two peaks 
when we say we model petal length or petal width, we model what we call average behavior. Does that make sense? When we model an average behavior, we don't get a proper average if there are more than one peak. Is that making sense? So we go for distributions because summary statistics has its own limitations. When we do distribution, two data set are not going to be same. There are going to be differences. This differences will be pronounced. Point number one. And we model an average behavior. When we say we predict petal length or petal width, we are going to model an average behavior which will be one point something or a two point something. And that won't be accurate because most of the values are in the range of five point something and one or less than one and somewhere two. Our average behavior will be somewhere in an area where nobody would be interested in or we won't be accurate enough. Is this clear why we go for distribution? Why a distribution is expected to have only one peak? What it means we have more than one peak? And what is the drawback? And how do we overcome that? Is that clear, guys? So, uh, so far we saw how do we represent data? And uh, how do we summarize data? What is the shortcoming of the summary? Summary will still use it, but wherever possible, we will use distribution because distribution represents the whole data. Summary will be a one number which may or may not represent. For example, if there are, we wouldn't know if there are one peak or more than one peak if we have used summary statistics. We would know there is more than one peak if we have used distribution. OK, guys, so those are the uh, distributions and we will see more of distributions. OK, now tell me. If we have five outcomes. One second, where is that? If we have a, uh, two dice and we are modeling some of the two outcomes, two dice are going to have two outcomes. It can be either 1, 1 or 1, 2 and 2, 1. The sum could be 4, sum could be 5. If you are modeling the sum of the two outcomes, do we have to uh, conduct the experiment and build the probability distribution? Where will we end up? If we conduct the experiment and build the probability distribution, we'll end up here. We are not going to end up any new distribution. Before even we conduct the experiment, we can do this distribution. Is that right, guys? Do we need do we need to conduct an experiment to see what will be the distribution of head and tail on a fair toss? Fair uh, toss of a fair coin. We don't need it, right? So for some, if the uh, requirement is standard. We don't need to conduct an experiment to build the distribution. Distributions are readily available. We can start calculating probability. What is the probability I get summation as 12? We don't need to conduct an experiment to arrive at this probability. We know it. This is how it's going to behave. What is the uh, magic behind this? We should repeat the experiment sufficient number of times to get this. If you have repeated the experiment only 20 times, the distribution may not look like this. If you have repeated the experiment 200 times, the distribution will look like this. So there are standard distributions available and many a times we will use standard distribution. And uh, uh, many courses don't focus on this distributions. Some extensive courses focus on this distribution, but we will we will see how this distribution benefits us when we do regression. So we will discuss some of the standard distributions now. 
Okay. Okay, this is a sheet which you can play with. There are drop downs. You want to see sepal length and you want to see it for all the data or only for this thing. So you can play with it. I'm going for the distribution chart. So normal distribution. How the normal distribution is shaped? What are the uh, 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 what are the properties of a bell curve? Let's talk about it. It is symmetric. It can have negative values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How the shape of the bell curve is designed based on the mu and sigma. So let's say I change the mu to three. You look at the values changing. You don't have to look at the values changing. You can look at the chart changing. You change it to five. You can play with this. That's why I prepared this. If I say my uh, mu is minus three, I get this. If I uh, increase the standard deviation, if I increase the standard deviation by four, so this is how normal distribution is. If you if we know beforehand, a data will follow a normal distribution. Normal distribution meaning it can have negative values. Uh, it has a symmetric property around its mean and the shape of the distribution is purely determined by standard deviation. I have an example. We'll talk about the example, but let's get comfortable with this sheet. So, uh, so this is how a uh, normal distribution looks like. OK. Now, now we'll talk about other standard use cases. I toss a coin or let's say instead of toss. OK, let, tossing a coin will be the easier example to start with. I toss a coin 10 times. That's an experiment of 10 times. I get a 30% of the time I get heads. Two parameters. I toss a coin n number of times. That is capital N. Oh, sorry, it has to be small n only. And my probability of getting a head is something. In this case, will I ever get a probability less than zero? No, right? So how? let's see how this thing changes. If I increase the probability to 0.5, if the 0.5 is the probability, what is the expected number of uh, heads I, give, I get in 20? If it is 50% probability I get a head, what is the expected number of heads I get in a 20 uh, toss? 10. So my maximum probability becomes a 10. I change it to 0.3. See my maximum probability becomes 0.3 means 6. This is the maximum probability. I reduce it to 0.1. If you notice, it won't go below 0. So binomial distribution has that. So uh, if you have a success or failure, uh, okay, the example here I have given is number of visitors to a website who downloaded the newsletter. Let's say I get 100 visitors daily and 20% of them downloads the news, newsletter. This can be modeled using binomial distribution. There is an event. There is a number on which the event has to happen. Number of visitors is 100 every day and I get 20% of them downloading the newsletter. What will be the distribution? That can be modeled with binomial distribution. Is this clear? We are finding standard use cases. Wherein we get standard distributions. We don't have to experiment it. We don't have to wait to experiment it. If we know these two numbers, let's say 0.8. If this is the number, then this will be my distribution of probabilities. So this is binomial distribution, 0.4. So all of you can play with it. <coughs> and if you know the uh, uh, cap n, this is the, if you know the uh, denominator n, we can use do using binomial. If you don't know the denominator n, then we use Poisson distribution. Number of virus attacks in a month for all the websites. How many virus attacks do you expect in a month? 
one attack, two attack, five attack. But do we know what is the uh, uh, denominator? So of the 10 attempts, two attacks happen. So 20% probability. I don't know the number of attempts, right? How do I model the number of virus attacks? 10 attacks attempted, two attacks succeeded. That means 20% success rate. But I don't know the number of attacks. I only know the uh, number of attempts. I don't know. I only know the number of attacks. So in this case, uh, it is modeled using Poisson distribution. The math behind math is uh, equations are all complicated. You can go through that, but uh, you can play with this. Again, if you give one, that is a maximum and uh, zero attacks is what uh, zero and one has what got equal probabilities and then there is an insignificant probability. So this can be modeled using Poisson. So binomial and Poisson distributions model what we call count. Your number of visitors who downloaded the newsletter, your number of virus attacks. If you have a count as your variable to be modeled or what we call Y, in regression, what we call y is equal to mx plus c, right? This dependent variable, this y variable, which we looking to model. If the y variable is having count, they are modeled using binomial or Poisson distribution. <coughs> we never bother, right? Most of the examples don't bother because they all assume y is normal. Y is normal, so I'm good with it. Is that the case? That's something we should think about it. OK, uh, uh, if it is binomial or Poisson, what will happen? If the Y is binomial or Poisson, how do I address the problem? If Y is exponential, what is exponential? Whenever we have a time variable that is waiting time, time spent in website before filling the application form. Website has an application form. You may wait. Uh, so you may spend five minutes in the website. Somebody may spend 10 minutes in the website. Somebody else may spend only two minutes in the website. So what is the time spent in the website before filling the application form? Here the time, the waiting time is modeled and henceforth we have something called exponential distribution. Exponential distribution has a parameter that's called lambda. Lambda is nothing but an average time. So if an average time spent on the uh, website is 0.5, then the probability distribution can be modeled like this. Let's say if I change the lambda to 1.5, it's much more smaller. Uh, I forgot the lambda, uh, this thing. It's going to become smaller and smaller. 0 0.1. It's one over the average. It's one by average, one by mu. So 0 0.1, 0 0.02, or 0.2, you can play with this and uh, it's modeled. Uh, if anything is called exponential uh, waiting time distributions are all exponential distributions and they have its own their own standards. And if your Y turns out to be a uh, waiting time. And your X is all other variables. Then it's exponentially modeled. And uh, so all linear regressions have normal, otherwise all nonlinear regressions have this distributions. So similarly, we have a negative binomial distribution. How, what is modeled with negative binomial distribution? Uh, we let's say we have a event uh, after a successful uh, attempts, uh, you uh, model the event. For example, visitors signing up for services after checking the pricing page three times. So things like this are modeled using negative binomial distribution. So yes is nothing but your uh, uh, number of successes in this case three times. And we have a probability as a parameter 0.4. So this is how negative binomial distributions work. And you want to model probabilities, then there is something called beta distribution. It takes various shapes. Proportion of visitors who exit the website 
before checking the products page. I get 100 visitors. What proportion of them exit before even checking the products page? I want to understand that. I want to model that. How do I model that? This is all probability, right? The Y is going to be between 0 and 1. So we, I model that using my beta distribution. Beta distribution takes all kinds of shape. Let's say if I give 1, 1, it's going to give me a uniform distribution. If I say 2, 2, this is going to give me a, a inverted parabola, you know, symmetric parabola kind of a distribution. So if you go here and you want to check the beta distribution in Wikipedia, it gives you all kind of a... Okay, I didn't use this. I go here, Wikipedia. Let's check the probability distribution function. This is a continuous distribution function. Oh, I use this slow in my case. Okay, this is the beta distribution, guys. Ah, here it is. Okay, it's not opening the page. I'll open only the image in new tab. Yes. So if you look at the, for different alpha and beta, the values in the x-axis ranges between 0 and 1. Well, uh, because that's what we are modeling. Look at the probabilities changing. Your 100% uh, probability or a 0% probability is high probable. Uh, the red color curve says the in-between probabilities are not much. It can look like a, a bell curve also. It can look like this green color that is exponential curve, log curve, or it can, if both are two, a alpha is equal to two, beta is equal to two, it will look like an inverted parabola. So these are some of the standard distributions. One more standard distribution is there, gamma. Uh, we can get the gamma. Gamma has its own parameters. I didn't have a use case, so I didn't bring it. So you have a standard uh, use case, then you don't have to do the experiment there. We don't have to, uh, without even doing the experiment, we can calculate probabilities. Only thing is we need to know either mu, sigma, or n, p, or n, or lambda, s, p, alpha, beta. These are some assumptions. If we make assumptions around these two variables, we can calculate probabilities. So that's the uh, advantage of knowing the distributions. Uh, we will use these distributions in the machine learning. Uh, uh, we will do this in regression tomorrow. We'll use this in regression tomorrow, but this is something you can play with today. Uh, Where is my PowerPoint? Yes. So that's to do with distributions. Any thoughts, any questions on distribution before we go to standardizations? I have only one more slide. We'll cover that quickly. Uh, one question I have, uh, you mentioned that uh, there are different kind of distribution for different, let's say, type of data or data sets. Mm -hmm. Uh, given a data set, uh, how do we make out what kind of distribution it fits to? Mm, that's the, uh, I have given an example here, right? So number of visitors is going to be normal, whereas number of visitors who downloaded the news, no, no, no. What I, possibilities. Sorry, what I meant to ask is, this is like, you know, kind of the description is there. Mm. If I have a data set, for example, some numbers are there. Mm. Is there any way systematically to analyze and say this is the kind of distribution it is? Mathematically, yes, there is something called fitting of distributions, uh, but uh, wouldn't suggest that. Um, yeah, you can fit a, you can take a data, uh, fit that to binomial distribution, Poisson distribution, and see which has the best fit and go for it. That's called fitting of distributions. Uh, uh, yeah, but that's going to be exhaustive, right? So if we know this, uh, uh, you know, some uh, standards, what is binomial, what is Poisson, what is exponential, then you don't need that. You can uh, straightforward go ahead with this.
So this is and, uh, sorry. Another question I had. Uh, maybe I'm asking too basic. Uh, you while while explaining, you were mentioning like uh, the normal distribution. Normally, it is for the linear regression and other things for non-linear, right? Yes. I mean, how how do I relate conceptually? Because for me, the binomial also is more of linear. In fact, we'll cover that tomorrow. Uh, I have, I don't have it the slide here. I have it in a different PPT. Uh, so if the data is normally distributed, I have a visual representation. Uh, you will get a, a linear regression. If if you visually see if the data is Poisson distributed, you will see it's log linear. You have to take a log transformation to make it linear. So that will cover it tomorrow. I okay. gave an idea only to give an idea because we never people never discuss these things in other courses. Most of the courses they don't discuss the binomial Poisson exponential negative binomial uh, because linear regression they'll assume regression is linear and move on. But uh, uh, that's because the assumption for the linear regression is data is normally distributed. What if that uh, assumption is broken? Then it becomes non-linear distribution. How do we address that? Then the distribution, one of this has to be applicable. So tomorrow we'll cover that. I have a nice visual slide for that. Not okay. Okay, and this is uh, okay. All the formulas are there. It, this this link is I've provided. I provided the link if you want to take a look at it. And uh, because you asked for this regression, uh, yeah, this this called generalized linear models. Because you asked for, I'm just giving a glimpse. Okay. Okay, here. Yeah, if you look at it, this is x and y. We are predicting y given x. Data at every point is normally distributed. Okay, then this is a linear, but if you look at it uh, in this particular case, data at 45 has higher variance, data at 3.5 has smaller variance, data at 1.5 has much more smaller variance. So that's what they have given it here like this. Lambda equal to 1, this is the variance. Lambda is equal to 5, lambda is equal to 10, this is the variance. So uh, again, they have represented this. Now, if you take average of each point, average of uh, points here, average of points here, average of points here, and average of points here, it will automatically become nonlinear. Whereas, if you take average of points at any point, let's say average of all the points around 1 will come here. Average of all the points around 2 will be here. Average of all, we are modeling the average, right? So, uh, if you connect all the averages, it will become linear. Whereas in this case, if, it, if you connect all the averages, average of all the values in 1, all the values in 1.5, all the values in 5, it will automatically become nonlinear. This nonlinearity uh, will have to be transformed. So how do we transform that is all a, if I take the uh, y alone log and then if we if I make it exponential, if I change this y to e to the power, then this becomes linear. So we'll discuss all this. <coughs> because you asked for it, I think I'll give a glimpse of it. OK, uh, so we'll quickly see what standardization is. Okay. What is standardization? Standardization is transforming the data with reference to a desired value. So this is something all of us must have used, right? X minus mu divided by sigma. So let's say we have 10 column data. In our data set, we have data like that, right? This is the data. Uh, here, sales is in hundreds. 200, 700, 900. Quantity is all in single digits and discount is in points, decimal points. Profit is in different scale. So how do I bring all this in the same scale? So I do this. 
I take the mean of those values divided by the standard deviation. This is something which we do it without even thinking for a second, right? So what are we doing actually speaking? What is happening here? I get a new column. I get a new value. Let's say for this four columns, I get new four columns. I get a standardized sales, standardized quantity, standardized discount profit. Why do you think all four columns have values in the same range or what range do I have values from? Any of you by making this transformation X minus mean by standard deviation, I get four new columns. All four columns have values in the same range, not like this. What values do I get and why do I get those values? And if I have to be critical about it, what should I? How do I be critical about it? So this probably means how far from the how how many standard deviation away from the mean something like that? Yes. So we are going to get values between minus three and plus three in all four columns. So what does that one mean? Let's say this has one, this has minus two. Either. So we have made standard deviation as a reference point and we have. Uh, we have calculated it. How far are we from standard deviation? So because we have done that. What are we losing? We are losing the actual quantum. We don't know if sales is in thousands or ten thousands or millions. We are interested in modeling the variance. So when we predict, we first get the variance and then we have to. Because we have modeled only the variance, we have not modeled the sales anymore. So we have to predict the variance. And then we have to derive the sales. So that one extra step we'll have to do it. So all of you got this. We have we, we have converted the actual values into the reference to variance. And in the process, we have lost the quantum of the uh, value and we got the variance that is between minus three and plus three. That's one way to standardize. There are other ways to standardize also, right? Uh, what will this do? This is a simple math. All of you know, right? Uh, this will normalize these values between 0 and 1 instead of normalizing the values between minus 3 and plus 3 or with respect to variance. This is all with respect to minimum. Minimum value is given 0 and rest of the values are derived. Minimum is a reference point. And uh, we can always do x divided by max x. Here in this case, what will happen? Maximum value will be 1. And the rest of the values are derived till 0. Now I will give you a use case. I have sales for so many years, weekly sales, 52 week sales for 2014, 15, 16, 17. What is the right standardization? All have different values, right? This year we have in thousands. This year we have in, I don't know. It's, uh, it's shifted probably. Yeah. All four has different scales. If I draw a chart, how do I normalize this? All four should look same. OK, it is all in the same range, but uh, some off ranges. If I have to standardize this, how will I standardize this? What is that? Can I do X minus mu by sigma? If I do X minus mu by sigma for 2014 separately, 2015 separately, 2016 separately, what are we looking at? We are looking at variance. We are looking to model variance. But in a time series, like this, the column A is a time series, right? It's ordered, ordered value. 
there is a reason why 304 is before 4619. It cannot be swapped. This has to remain ordered. For an ordered series like this, what is that we are looking to model? Or if I can show you the different options, which one will you choose? Why? The first one, maybe. Why? That is uh, a relative value with the entire uh, range in that minimum. Series. That's uh, the desired value is minimum, right? Reference value is minimum. Minimum will be zero, and rest of the values derived based on that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's the way, but. Uh, uh, I have worked on some projects. This was news to me. This is where I learned. Let's say we have this 10 values. This divided by some, what will it give? This is also normalization. The value will be in between 0 and 1. You add all this. Basically, these are proportions, right? These are percentages. Yeah. You add all this, it will be adding to 1. So when we divide each value by sum, we'll get 1. What will we get if we divide each value divided by average? Any thoughts? You will get the sum. There are 14 values. OK, I will tell what I wanted to tell now. By dividing by average, what are we going to get? Somebody can think aloud for me. This is the last thing we'll be discussing this. By dividing this value by average, What are we getting? Uh, number of items like placement. No. We said when we do this, when we do this first uh, operation, we get variance with reference to variance. We yeah, said so with reference to minimum. Right? With uh, reference to minimum. When we divide it by mean, what are we getting? We are getting it with reference to mean. Does that trigger something? So it is. Uh, uh, what does this mean? When I divide 304 divided by mean, when I divide 4619 divided by mean, and uh, when I divide 2590 by mean, let me do one thing. Let's calculate the average and see. I think it's distribution. See, the average is 9058. So I am in effect. Dividing every number by 9058. That's what the thing is happening. Yes. Yeah. What what does this division mean? So does it uh, signify the variance in y axis in terms of uh, value? Um, so Not there is a lot of distribution. distribution, right? So okay. when will it be more than one? When will it be less than one? I'm dividing by a number. So it has to be more than that number or less than that number. The only two options is the number which I'm dividing has to be more than 9058 or less than 9058. What will happen if it is more than 9058? For the example, in this case. It will be one plus. If it is less than 9058, it will be less than one. In a time series, let's say this is sales by week. 52 weeks I have sales and I have number that is going to be like this. So 
If I move this to OK, not like this. Move this chart. If we have to discuss this chart. The one is the boundary. Above average, if it is more than one, the values are above average. If it is less than one, the values are below average. Is that clear? Is that something? Yeah. Yeah, if the value is above one, it is above average. If the value is below one, it is below average. So in a sales scenario, I get to know which is a peak season, which is off season. So looks like second half of the year, I have a lot of peak season. First half of the year, only during the 12th week, I get a peak. Otherwise, it's mostly off. So the festival season is in the second half of the year. Or the shopping season is in the second half of the year. Barring few exceptions. So now if I do this for year after year, I should get some amount of standardization. Though these numbers may be off, I get second half of the year is where sales mostly happens. And if I do some smoothing here, moving average smoothing, and uh, I get to know if I divide uh, the whole series by a mean, I get to know when is it off season, when is it peak season, or when is it above average or when is it below average. So basically the formula means that only, right? We are dividing the value by mean. So what we come to know is mean is the reference point. Mean is the reference point. So we have to describe the new data point, new series with respect to mean. Here, standard deviation is the reference point. So we express the new column which we created in terms of standard deviation. In this case, mean is a reference point. So we express the new column which we created with respect, with respect to the new reference point. In this case, mean. So how do we express the with respect to mean is above average, below average. In a time series, this helps a lot. When is it above average? When is it below average? You may want to uh, take some calls based on uh, this. Whereas if you have, if you don't have a time series data, let's say we have data like height or weight. In those cases, above average, below average may be making sense. Yeah, in height and weight, above average, below average may be making sense. Or uh, with respect to variance, also things may make sense. So we have options. We have we can think the math and choose what standardization we can look at. Hmm? That is one. Another way is tan inverse. People can think of what is tan inverse. So any value I have, the larger the value, let's say 200 tan arc tan, I think, right? No. How do I do tan inverse in Excel? I forgot. By tan or something like that, no? Yes. So you have a value and you take tan inverse, it will be between 0 and 1. Uh, the reason is uh, I used it somewhere, that's what I thought I'll tell this. We have two columns of data. One divided by the other. We create a new column, one divided by the other. What do we get? A slope. What is the slope formula? No, slope run is what I thought. Okay. What is 4 divided by 3? In this case, sorry, 3 divided by 4. Rise over run, right? If you have two columns, one column has 3 as the value, another column has 4 as the value, you 
visualize it as two different dimensions and you can calculate the slope, right? And uh, slope is going to be between 0 and infinity. And you do a tan inverse, you get a value between 0 and 1. That is another way to normalize it. We have normalized the value uh, derived out of two columns between 0 and 1. So that's the tan inverse uh, in time series and all I've used it. I thought I'll, when you have, this is all, if you have one column, you want to standardize it, you do it. If you have two columns, you want to make one column out of it and standardize it, you can do this. Think about the math, then it will make sense. So I do tan inverse. Uh, uh, cosine distance also can be used as Normalization, right? What will be the cosine distance range? It will be having date value between 0 and 1. Z sorry, minus 1 and plus 1. We saw that, right? Cosine distance has negative values also, unlike Euclidean distance. And the range of values cosine distance can take is between plus one and minus one. That is that has its own specific use cases. Let's not confuse that with this. But there are ways and means to standardize it. So if you think of math, more and more math, you can uh, standardize the data. So this standardization is important. Uh, this standardization is always important because if you have uh, uh, different scales, you have to bring it to the same level before even attempting any statistics because otherwise a larger number will mean larger weight, smaller number will mean smaller weight. You, will, you wouldn't get a, a sensible outcome. That's the reason standardization is important. So that's all I had for the day. Basically what all we covered today, how do we represent data? We represented data in rows and columns or vectors and matrices. Uh, we saw what are the advantages and uh, we also saw summary statistics and uh, to distribution for different types of data and normalization slash standardization options. So that's what we covered today. We'll cover the tomorrow stuff. Uh, these are the ones we'll cover tomorrow. And we have the third day also in place. So we can, if we can discuss, if we have questions, we can discuss. Any thoughts? Was this useful? Can you paste that Google Drive link here so that uh, people can copy right away? Okay, Google Drive. I have put things in Google Drive. Where is my Google Drive? One second, I have to find out the Google Drive. There's this Q&A section. There you can post it. What happened to my Google Drive? It's not here. It has to or be. I can post, post it on Meetup later. Yeah, meetup. Meet yeah. I thought Google Drive, drive.google.com. No, I have the link. You sent it to me on. Yeah, yeah. So I can put it from there. Yeah. This is the one, day one. Uh, I have to share it. Anyone with the link, copy. Uh, I think I can put it here. No. Yeah. I cannot put it here. So the slide and the sheets, slides and sheets are available. You can take a look at it. For day two, I'll put it tomorrow. So you can't put it on the chat. In the Q&A, you can put it. Sorry, where? Come again? Q&A, Q&A. There's one more link, no? Maybe it's not visible to you because you are doing it from browser. Okay. 
Okay. But on the Teams app, there is a Q&A section. I so tried there, to me using Q&A, but it did not allow me. For some reason, I'm not able to do that. Okay, okay. So we'll put it in the meetup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the YouTube uh, video will also have it. Okay, any thoughts, any feedback? Uh, we are open now. Any questions, we can take it up. Uh, sir, converting it into uh, like vector representation, mm -hmm. there I could not understand. A vector representation, uh, okay. So you have this 949, right? Two columns. First column has 9, second column has 49, 24, 54. Now, instead of storing it in the table or conceiving it as in a tabular form, you can conceive it as a vector form 9, 49. Now it becomes a coordinate which you can plot it in the chart. Mm, correct. Yes. So now I have two points, uh, x1 and x2. I can take two points and calculate distance between them. Instead of calculating the Euclidean distance, Euclidean distance, we know what the formula, right? y2 minus y1 whole square x2 minus x1 whole square the under root of the sum instead of that if i i can consider the angle between them as the distance uh, but what would we consider as origin origin will be 0 comma 0 or until unless you define it as something else okay until unless you define it as something else it will be 0 comma 0 uh, the theta will be the distance, but we don't represent it in theta. We represent it as a cos inverse of the theta. It could be my, it could be plus one to minus one. The distance could be plus one to minus one. You know, minus one means both uh, vectors are pointing in different directions. If it is, yeah. So it's it's about conceiving. It's all same data. It's the same data instead of conceiving it as a list or in rows and columns, conceive it as a, a coordinates which can be plotted or as a matrix which you can think of. And uh, more representations also possible. It's how we wanted to represent our data, right? It's same data. Uh, so, like uh, the data we saw uh, later in the uh, Excel sheet, like mm -hmm. it has multiple entries, but that cannot be converted as a vector, right? Because on, mm -hmm. only the numbers can be converted as vectors. No, we can convert. Uh, basically, you have to convert the categorical data into one hot encoding, uh, or in some other form, you have to represent it. One hot encoding. Is there any other way? Uh, let's say south, north, west, central, these four values are there. Uh, you want to represent it as one, two, three, four. Mathematically, that doesn't make sense. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's up to you. Or in four different dimensions, instead of uh, things like that, you can represent it and then call it out. So formula for uh, any calculation will also change based on uh, the number of variables we have, right? I mean, variables means number of columns. And I don't see what you are trying to say, but uh, yeah, you'll have to think about if mathematically things will make sense. Okay, okay. Understand. Not sure what you're trying to say, but I would say mathematically, will it make sense? Yes. Go ahead, otherwise uh, rectify it. Sure, just one so. point I couldn't uh, relate, uh, Swamnathan. Uh, the example what you mentioned, like, you know, instead of uh, values, if we make it vector, we can see the, you know, these two plots uh, with the angle separation. Uh, angle separation, okay. As the theta value. Uh, in practical terms, if I have to understand where could it be used? For example, uh, if I see the distance between A and B, mm -hmm. that could still mean something in terms of the X reference and Y reference. 
okay how far or how high how tall and things like that okay but if i try to see in terms of angle what does it mean here okay instead of looking at this diagram assume the point is on the other side point a is on the other side of the y axis in that case uh, you will have a, a cosine distance which is negative value which means it's on different quadrants okay so it will give the direction sense yes it will not give the quantum of the distance it will it basically it represents the theta okay the larger the theta larger the distance and it gives the sign also for you okay. so cos theta is equal to this uh cos 180 will be minus 1 cos 0 will be 1 cos 90 will be 0 so this is the cosine distance okay yeah so the idea is to encourage you to think mathematically so if it doesn't make sense that's fine uh see what makes sense to you until it makes sense to you uh uh don't use it it has to make sense to you because you are going to take the calculations forward right okay so i hope it is useful so tomorrow's one we'll extend the distributions and see the applications for machine learning and we will also see dimensionality reduction dimensionality increase how those things will help us in building our models and clustering kind of we saw the distance formula is what we wanted to discuss otherwise we'll discuss the remaining stuff okay if there are no other questions can we close this for the day and then we'll recoup tomorrow yeah yes sir it was helpful okay then talk to you all tomorrow same time guys thanks for joining